And I get to have one of our neighbors here in Everett come in today to join us for our outdoor version of the Happy Homeowner. So if this is your first time listening to the Happy Homeowner podcast, which I imagine we're going to have a lot of first timers today. Uh, real quickly, I, as a mortgage professional, help a lot of people finance real estate. And a big part of financing real estate is making smart financial decisions with your money and creating wealth through homeownership. So today is not about that, but it's saving money and saving time. And, you know, us outdoors, when we kind of have this thing called an ego. So this will help increase your chances of coming back to the docks with a bigger ego, I guess, right? Let this sink in for a moment. The lack of financial education cost Americans $450 billion in 2021. 78% of American homeowners are living paycheck to paycheck. And right now, most American homeowners are equity rich and cash poor. That's another word for broke. The media isn't helping you. Schools aren't helping you. And the government for sure isn't going to save you. As a top 1% mortgage professional and seasoned investor, I cannot sit around and watch these life-changing skills that I've learned outside of traditional schooling be unused, untaught, and thrown in the trash can. So until these statistics change, I'll be here every single week preaching and teaching personal and professional finance, information that you can use in your life, however that looks, whether you are 16, or 60. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Homeowner Podcast. My name is Dan Keller. I'm a local mortgage professional right here in Everett, Washington, and I get to have one of our neighbors here in Everett come in today to join us for our outdoor version of the Happy Homeowner. So if this is your first time listening to the Happy Homeowner Podcast, which I imagine we're going to have a lot of first timers today. Uh, real quickly, I, as a mortgage professional, help a lot of people finance real estate. And a big part of financing real estate is making smart financial decisions with your money and creating wealth through homeownership. So today is not about that, but it's saving money and saving time. And, you know, us outdoors, when we kind of have this thing called an ego. So this will help increase your chances of coming back to the docks with a bigger ego, I guess, right? <laughs> so I've got Connor and Malachi from John Sporting Goods, uh, just awesome outdoorsmen, wealth of information. In fact, I've been going to John Sporting Goods since I was a little kid with my dad. And so what we've got today is we're the end of January. And here next week, we have, we're all waiting to get back out on the water to fish in the Puget Sound. And we have winter blackmouth. The season opener is Wednesday, February 1st. And so Connor and Malachi are gonna teach you everything you need to know about going out there and having some fun in the winter and putting some salmon in the boat. So welcome guys. Thanks Dan. Yeah, Appreciate thanks Dan it. for the info. So everything that we need to know, starting from area 10, what is area 10? Where will you guys be fishing um, on Wednesday? And kind of, we're going to talk about area 10. We're going to talk about gear. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Connor. We're going to start. You already have the tides down. You have everything. So literally, if you could even take this podcast out, it's going to be on YouTube as well, out on the boat with you. You're going to rig up everything. You're going to be fishing at the right depths. We're going to share maps here in a second. But why don't let, let's just start. What is it going to be? 7 o'clock, 7.30, Wednesday morning is the right tide, and we're going to go from there. Yeah. So starting February 1st, which is Wednesday, like Dan was saying, uh, we have a high tide, which we won't all make because it's early in the morning. Uh, it's a 345 high tide. So our low tide is starting at 756. So most of us will probably arrive down in Area 10 if we're heading out of uh, Everett. We'll probably get there for that low tide. And uh, for myself, if I'm fishing on a low tide or low slack tide down in Area 10, one of the spots that I'm interested in is definitely Jeff Head. Mm -hmm. uh, I like fishing that north end of Jeff Head. Uh, especially on the low slack. It's a great spot where as the tide, you ha probably have an hour after that low tide where the water is going to slow down and then it's going to start coming in. And what that does, once you find the bait, it's going to push that bait up against a wall. And uh, once that's happening, it's easy to dissect where this is going to be. And, uh, you know, we're fishing that 90 to 120 feet. And, uh, yeah, it's a great spot. Uh, so now I know you mentioned earlier, you're going to be out there Wednesday morning with John yep. and you're going to do, 
you're going to you're going to give us a gift on Wednesday. You're going to go live on Facebook Absolutely. on the John Sporting Goods page. Yep. And hopefully you'll have a fish in the boat so you'll be able to kind of, you know, see what the fish are feeding on, what size, and kind of yep. give us some more intel there. And then talk also about location, where you guys are at, and what's doing well, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, generally, like I was saying, we're going to be on the north end of Jeff Head, and mm-hmm. we're going to be 90, 120 feet. But uh, we'll be closer to that Apple Tree Cove area. Okay. And uh, as the tide progresses, we're going to work our way out towards the shipping channel. Again, we don't know where the bait is right now. We don't know how much bait is there, and we don't know what the bait looks like. Uh, so... February 1st is kind of a recon to see what's going on and what size the bait's going to be. Okay, cool. So you just that's where you're going to be, Jeff Head. Uh, that's across on the other side of the Puget Sound. So there's a couple other areas, Area 10, that you like. So we're going to go into depth, but let's talk about a couple of the other areas. Yeah, a couple other areas where just in history's past where we've found uh, blackmouth and good blackmouth spots that hold bait. Uh, definitely, like I said, the Kingston, Apple Tree Cove area, that mm-hmm. would be just north of where we're going to be, okay. uh, is definitely a spot where we found bait and we found blackmouth. Okay. Um, then take us across the channel there, we'll be fishing. The oil docks has been an awesome spot in, in past. Uh, maybe using a little different gear there, just as far as what's, what's there. Uh, typically a hoochie, ace high fly rig. Um, and that's just because of the docks. You have pilings there, which will bring in different bait, and that would be squid, cool. uh, which they'll definitely feed on. And then just south of that, we have Richmond Beach, which, uh, you know, it's kind of a, not a bunch of structure there, but it's a big sand flat mm-hmm. and, again, holds bait. And a lot of the times there we're fishing hardware, so spoons, yeah. plugs, uh, definitely a small herring or a small anchovy. Um, those are going to be definitely the four spots that we focus on. And like I said, uh, Jeff Head, there's a lot of structure there where uh, bait gets pushed around and pushed up into walls where we can dissect them. And then, of course, when we get there, we're going to be looking for fish in the bait. Because you can have all the bait in the world, but if there's no salmon in there, yeah. you know, you're know, you wasting your time. So let's head back over to Jeff Head, and let's talk about trolling speeds. Yeah. Yeah, now... If you look at the tides, they're really small. I mean, you have two foot exchanges, right? Okay. Um, so a lot of the times with that regard, it can kind of scatter the bait. They can still swim against the tide because mm-hmm. the current's very little. Um, so it can it might be a little tricky finding where the bait is and finding if the fish where the fish are at that point. Um, but for me, yeah, we're gonna get there. The most common speeds are probably between two and four miles an hour, Uh, but what takes precedence over this is your downrigger angle. Uh, 45 degree angle just seems to be that number where we get a lot of great action on our flashers and our spoons. Um, And we're always trolling with the tide if you can. And like we were talking earlier, uh, it's a small enough tide to where, say I go through some bait and there's fish in it and we hook a fish, Mm -hmm. you can generally turn around and then go back through there against the tide. And I'm not gonna, I wouldn't recommend that if we had a big tide exchange, like say it was six to 10 feet, you'd have to pick up, run back up to where you started and troll back with the tide. One thing to note is if you do have those larger tides, you shouldn't be trolling for two, three, four miles Mm -hmm. in a straight line, especially if you're hooking fish. You should pick your gear up once you're out of it, run to the top, keep your drifts real short. You want to stay in the fish. I mean, it's just like any other fishery, especially with school and fish. You, you got to be on top of them. Otherwise, you're not there. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier when we were talking before the show, too, that don't go chasing bait balls. Stay down on the bottom. Bounce the bottom. Make sure you're staying on the bottom. So how important is that? Yeah, it's it's real important. I mean, if you ever watch Connor or I or any other great blackmouth fishermen, you, you'll see them. They're running the downriggers hard. I mean, we're beating the sand with the downrigger balls probably every 30, 45 seconds a minute at most checking all the time. I mean, the only time that we're ever off bottom is if we're fishing real deep water. I mean, we're talking 160 to 200 plus feet. Then we'll start chasing marks. We'll start chasing bait. But your 90 to 120 foot line, your safety zone, you're on bottom. Well, you can't see this right now as a viewer, but we've got a mini John Sporting Goods store sitting here on the table. So let's let's get into the fun stuff and let's, uh, let's rig up some lures and show them what works out there for Area 10 Blackmouth, okay? Well, as you all know, we've definitely been running, I mean, we run 11 inch flashers for sure in, the, in all regards, uh, but we've turned to these new Pro Troll Blinky flashers a couple years ago. 
And again, 90 to 120 feet of water, there's not a whole heck of a lot of light getting down there. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely one thing we like to do. This is probably one of the more notorious setups. Definitely will be fished on the opener. Uh, we got the green hornet, which you got moon jelly, green, of course, a blinky light. Mm -hmm. And then on the back side, you have glow tape, which again, when it's dark, there's no light down there. The glow really sticks out to them. Cool. Uh, again, when this thing hits the water, you have a blinking light right here, and that just creates a crazy amount of attractant for a salmon or blackmouth. And then, of course, we have this is a three inch cookies and cream spoon. Uh, just very natural looking, looks a lot like our bait fish down there. And this is gonna resemble two things. I mean, it's gonna resemble a small herring for sure, uh, and also a sand lance. And when you're catching these blackmouth, they're gonna have, I mean, their faces are gonna be just torn to crap on their cheeks. Okay. And that's all due to them in the dirt, eating a lot of sand lance for sure. Uh, so you wanna key in on that for sure. And you're gonna start, on Wednesday with a three, a three oh. Yeah, okay. I mean, just in past okay. that it resembles so much sand lance, a small herring. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's definitely one that I like to start with. Okay. Now, say we catch a fish on it and we pull it, cut the belly open and look in the stomach and there's a six inch, five inch herring. Okay. I'm gonna bump it up to the so next so size. Okay, like there you go. Yep. So your Malachi's showing us over here, show this camera, what is that? That's atomic right there. That's a four incher. Mm -hmm. The fives work well, especially especially now. It's pretty hard to get the fours with atomic doing what they're doing. Okay. But the four inchers is a classic size. When you're running into that, either a bigger sand lance or your four, five, six inch herring, you can either go with a helmet and a herring of the same size or a plug. Plugs and that very that color is that the mother of pearl? Yeah, this okay. one's your six oh three mother of pearl. Okay. I also have the six oh two sitting here. I don't yeah. know if the camera will pick that up. Yep, one's that's red, your, one's pink. That's your main difference there. Yep. Um, another one, and I started fishing this just, just a few years ago. I started testing with these silver hordes as well. These guys are really nice, and they give you a bigger profile. It's, it's a little close to atomic tubby. Okay. Um, they got a little more girth here, so especially if you're around herring. Okay. Those are nice for fishing around herring. Cool. Come into John's and see how they rig those two because that's, does it come custom like that? Or does that come like that? Or did you guys um, customize that? So the silver hordes, they will come chain swivel, okay, welded ring swivel. And then we strap on, yeah. this is our hook of choice, spoons, plugs, you name it. Okay. That's an owner stinger side wash. Uh, match them to your plug. Mm -hmm. So a three aught, you know, a four inch plug is going to work great. Same thing with a four aught. And then when you bump up to a five inch plug, you're going to go to your five aught. Yeah. Understand See, that was big. About five years ago, John showed me that. I came in and bought a plug because guys were saying they were catching salmon uh, out of possession on plugs. And he was like, you know how to rig one? I said, I've never fished one before. And he goes, well, here. And he, and he helped me out with that. So come in and they'll give you some, some hacks on that. Now, real quick, before we move on, um, going back to that spoon setup that you have, spoon flasher, what's your leader length on that? And what kind of, what pound test are you running? Anytime I'm running a flasher, there's a lot of shock involved, especially in short sections. I'm running 30 pound or better. Okay. When I'm running spoons, and this applies to all sizes, 2.0 all the way up to the big 4.0s, 42 inches. Okay. Back of the flasher to the top of that spoon every time, 42 inches. 30 pound liter, 42 inch length. Awesome, guys. Cool. Uh, anything else? You're not going to be fishing uh, a lot of squids over there, right? So you're going to be going mainly plugs and spoons yeah, that, and that, bait. That Jeff Head fishery, okay. there's, there's always a lot of sand lance, always a lot of herring over there. So we're typically going... Our spoons, okay. match them appropriately to bait size, plugs, same thing, and yep. then we'll we'll roll a lot of herring or anchovies and helmets, and that works really well. You want to talk about that real quick while you got it? Yep. Okay. I got it right here. So this one's a crippled anchovy. The Rice Davis heads work really well as well. Okay. So what you're going to do is I space these out to the size of bait I'm running. So I, I think I space these ones out to a green label chovy. Ideally, you want this forward hook right behind the peck fins okay. and this one in line or just past the tail of your bait. And I got my helmet here. It's going to keep our bait lasting a lot longer and it's going to be a little easier to spin. And one little trick both Connor and I use is on bait and plugs since we're not using flashers with these guys as we drop our leader size. Okay. We go down the 20, you get a lot better action out of your lures that way. Okay. 
running about six feet of 20 pound. Yep. And then I go to some form of chain swivel and that'll attach to my main line. So the really cool thing, if you uh, as an outdoorsman can uh, lower your ego, if you will, like I have in the past, I've come in and just asked you guys to help me rig something in the past. These guys are so awesome. They'll, they'll help, they'll sell something to you, but then they'll help you rig it right there. So all you got to do is go out and hook it up and fish. So if you have any, any questions or you want some help around that, and that's the, the big difference between you guys and other sporting goods shops, the bigger ones that, that we all know of. Uh, you guys are in the trenches and you're able to help like that. So I really, I really appreciate that with you guys. Um, okay, so we've talked about the hardware. I think you had some really great cute questions in your Facebook group the other day. You want to jump in? Is there anything we missed before we move on from the hardware? One thing, especially if you're running bait, you definitely want to cure it. Okay. Uh, if you cure that herring or anchovy, it's just going to hold in that helmet you know, okay. a lot better. Um, with our her- if we're running herring, we're going to run a three-aught hook. you got to kind of bump your hooks down a little bit. And the okay. reason being, the gauge of the hook is going to be smaller. Uh, if you use too large, it rips your herring up. And uh, again, it's hard to tell with bait if your your bait is still on your line because you're sending it down. Okay. Uh, and that's the advantage to using a plug as well. Uh, if you get a strike, you don't have to, you don't have to pull up and check, you know, and say there wasn't a fish. If you have bait, you get stri- a strike. You have to pull it up and check because yeah. they'll rip that right out of the helmet. So that's one advantage with the Tomic plug for sure. Love it. So, Kieran, w- run us through real quick how you cure. Your yeah, hearing. there's definitely a few ways. There's all sorts of cures on the market. There's not like one mm-hmm. best one, you know. Uh, I really like the Pro Cure. They have a liquid cure. Okay, uh, makes it very simple. I mean, I put them in a gallon Ziploc. Okay, put all my herring or my anchovy in there, and then I cover them with the liquid cure. Now, say for instance, we're mooching where we're going to be cutting our bait. Mm-hmm. I'll probably add a little rock salt to okay. it just to firm them up okay. a little bit more. But that liquid cure keeps them nice and plump. Keeps cool. It actually adds UV to your bait too. Okay. Yeah, it makes them makes them excellent. Cool. For sure. And you said about twenty four hours before you head out. Yeah, if you did. Okay. Yeah, right it in there. it cool. definitely helps to give them a date. Yep. Cure them, throw them in the fridge. You're good. Yep. Yep. Good to go. Okay. Good. Um, I do see something down there before we move on. Scent. Oh yeah. Okay. Are you scenting your spoons? You scenting your? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're, this is our scent of choice. Okay. Lunker lotion. It's just a herring scent. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. there, there's all sorts of smells you could use for sure. This one's nice because it's thick. So mm-hmm. any kind of hardware that I'm using, uh, spoons, plugs, I'm definitely going to add a little little bump of that on there. Okay. And then say we're fishing over on the oil dock side and we're running hoochies, okay. you're going to want to strip herring out, so fillet the sides off the herring and cure that. Okay. And that's going to go on your top hook. And that's it's mostly just to cover up our smell you okay. know, and give them a little incentive to love find it. that bait. I love it. Okay, so I think Scott Hollett had a question in your group. Uh, when using herring, what's the best setup for leader link? I think we already, we talked about that, but let's recap on yeah. that. So I know yeah, Malachi we, was saying a little bit little bit less pound test, yeah, right? Yeah, we go like hardware's 30 pound, and especially if we're using a flasher, we're going to use 30 pound leader. Okay. Uh, you know, but if we're running a herring with no flasher or anything in front of it, I like to do my arm's length, so I do a six foot leader, okay. and it's going to be a lighter twenty pound leader. Okay, and you're just you're just stretching it, stretching yeah. across your body. Yeah, I just do an arm's okay. length, cool. and uh, you know that just for me works better. Yep. And twenty pounds going to, it's just a little looser, so it really lets the action of that herring go. Okay, I love this one, Mark Vandermeulen. Uh, what is the best way to extend the season, and uh, how do we keep sublegal fish from being caught? Yeah, no, this is a great question, and this is one we all think of uh, in years past mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, one way to get away from shakers, in my opinion, would be run Tomic plugs, okay. run hardware. You just generally don't catch, not saying you won't catch a shaker, uh, but generally you're going to get a little bit better fish on that kind of present, just a bigger presentation. Yeah, okay. I would say with plugs and bait, more often than not, when we get a strike, it's a legal fish. Okay. More often than not, yeah, you guys don't have the fun of rod tips bouncing all day long, mm-hmm. but when you get one, it's it's more often than not, it's a good fish. All right, so Mark, the answer is plugs and bait, buddy. Okay, Sandy Chu, um, this is a good one. So how do you read structure relative to the tide? So typically what we're going to do, we look at the tide, whichever way it's going, depending on where we fish, say 
Jeff Head's a great one. Um, it's a big bar jutting out into the main shipping channel. Whichever yes, way the current's going, it's going to push that bait up against a wall. So say we got you know an incoming tide, it's going to push it across from north to south across the bar. I'm going to find that break and wherever that bait is pushed up against a wall. That's where your fish are going to stack to. And they're food motivated fish, so that's where you're going to find them. Yeah, and we'll have that map that you guys have in your, your saltwater guide, right? And John's yeah. saltwater guide, so you can pick up one of those at John's. Um, but what we'll do if you're on YouTube, we're going to put this up on the screen right now because you explained it really well as the tide comes in, what it's doing to that bait. So that's why you're fishing that that particular part yeah. of the bar. And, and I know Sarah with uh, Pacific Northwest Fishing had a great question too. Timing, is there a specific time of the day or a certain tide that fishes better um, that you've had more success in? Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about Jeff Head, we'll just go off that because it's a, a mm -hmm. great place to, to explain all of this. So we have a low tide, like I said, at 7.56 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So right at tide change when the water slows down is generally when these fish are going to feed. Okay. And right at the beginning of that incoming, that north end of Jeff Head is going to be absolutely dynamite. It's going to take the bait all the way across to the north side of Jeff Head. Okay. And then it's going to push that bait when the tide starts moving back in. It's going to push it right up against a wall. And uh, we can find them that way. And that's where you're just talking about going parallel to the shoreline, yep. 90 to 120 feet. So, yep, 90 okay. to 120 okay. feet. And we're going to, there you'll be trolling kind of in a southeast uh, troll. Okay. Uh, and yeah, as the, t the tide progresses, you'll just slowly see the tide move out towards cool. the shipping channel. So you'll be starting closer to Apple Tree co uh, Apple yep. the Cove. Absolutely. And then heading the trolling south. Okay, go. cool. Great. Um, we've got another really good question. I think this is Colby Stewart, right? Am I saying yep. that right, Colby? Mm -hmm. All right. You find more fish and bait uh, where the tide hits the structure or on the back side of the structure? Exactly. Kind of just like what we pointed out. Yeah, I mean, we're going to fish the very beginning of the tides on one end and progressively move towards the other. And as the tides put, the bait can't fight the tide and the current very much. So as it's pushing it up against a wall, it's okay. definitely where I like to, to pick them off on. Love that. Okay. Well, what do you think? We miss anything? I think I'm ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked to get out there. Is there anything you guys want to, uh, want to wrap up with? Yeah. I mean, all of this stuff that we've went over and we're always available in the, in the store down in at John sporting goods. Uh, we'd be more than happy to run you through this in person and show you kind of what, how we like to set this up and definitely recommend picking up a saltwater fishing journal. Uh, just, bunch of good information and it takes away the question of what tide and where I should yeah. fish. It tells you exactly where you need to Connor be. have a hundred coffees at our disposal and most of the time we still have one on the boat. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a must have. Well, and I know what you guys, you guys have recently become a lot more active on social media. I know you've committed to coming out on the opener, doing a Facebook live, kind of, you know, letting everyone know what's going on, how things are going. Um, and I know you've got a lot of connections, so you'll be in communication and be filling in the anglers with the uh the right places to be and what to use so appreciate you guys coming on i know this is fun this is valuable i mean this is valuable to me but the more i create content for my friends and my past clients the more i find out there's people that are out fishing in lakes and rivers and the puget sound and so i hope to have you guys back in the near future but we'll uh we'll see you guys out there on wednesday sounds good we appreciate yeah. you having us here dan Thank oh you yeah very much. all right bye for now you guys